great. Lovely. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, this is going to be a kind of um, traditional set of slides type of thing. But if you want to jump in with a question or something, feel free to. Uh, I just won't necessarily be able to see you, but hopefully uh, uh, you, do, you can use the, if you're on Zoom, you can use the raise hand feature and it should flag up for me and I can, can jump in with a question, OK? Um, so the uh, the full title of this is actually Playing with Words, Challenges in Adapting Literature to Gameplay. That really didn't fit on the schedule. But the vague idea is indeed, like, how do you turn a piece of literature into a game? And how do you capture the proper feel of that? Um, and we'll be going through uh, a few different uh, elements of this. So firstly, just an introduction to the topic and to myself. Uh, then we'll be talking about a concept called ludonarrative dissonance. Uh, which I'll explain what that is and the implications of that. Um, then we'll be moving on to what's called enumerating the unknowable. So how do you translate things like magic and horror and other kind of vaguely defined things uh, in literature to something that's actually compatible with the, the nuts and bolts of gameplay? Uh, then we'll be looking at conflict without combat. So how can you have gameplay that isn't purely reliant on combat? Because most literature isn't just chock full of fight, 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 whilst most games are. And then some positive examples from, from various different uh, areas where different pieces of literature have been adapted to really interesting games. Okay, so let's crack on. Firstly, I myself, I'm Darren Gray, or Darren Ginger, as I'm now known, apparently. Uh, so... Uh, I'm author on a bunch of games, such as Jupiter Hell and Tales of Magial. I've made a bunch of my own games, and I've written some short stories relevant to Elite. Um, and I run a podcast called Roguelike Radio, which is a bit inactive at the moment um, due to uh, various uh, pressures on my time, but hopefully will be revived soon. But in general, I like talking about games and writing, and that's sort of why I want to talk about this topic. Um, so what is an adaptation so you'll be familiar with movie adaptations right um that when you're adapting a piece of literature it could be pride and prejudice it could be lord of the rings it could be whatever um you have to consider a lot of different degrees of faithfulness now you don't need to be 100 percent faithful um, it's not necessarily what an adaptation is about um but a lot of people do look for faithfulness it's a it's a big thing that fans of a genre will look for when they're trying to see that the the literature piece has been turned into uh, another medium. So you could consider the visuals, right? Do the characters look like how they're described in the book? Or do the settings look like how they're described in the book? Uh, and this is the characters and how they behave, um, including the, the, all the different elements of the characterization. There's the setting itself. You know, if it's a medieval setting, then does it really capture the feel of that setting? If it's a sci-fi setting, does it get the right tone of the future, right? Because you can have lots of different ways of representing sci-fi settings. Um, there's the narrative itself. So does the story follow the same beats as the original story? Or does it go in its own direction while still containing the kind of the, the core of what the narrative is about and the messages that are in there? And then lastly, there's tone and meaning. So... Uh, if you have uh, an original work that is all about sort of tension in uh, in the interplay between characters, but your adaptation just ends up a flashy fighting show or game or whatever, then you fail to capture the real tone of the original work. You've, you've turned it into just something different, um, which could be fine, um, but it could be that a lot of fans of the original work would not be that happy or even the authors of the original work. And meaning, does it capture the moral messages? Um, and there's been lots of interesting examples where, where people have gone the opposite. So Starship Troopers, for instance, the original was a pro-war book, but the, the movie adaptation um, struck a completely discordant tone with the, the source work. So you can get lots of different ways of playing with this. These aren't hard and fast rules, but it's things you have to think about at least. Right? And with gaming, there's something extra, and that is the gameplay. So uh the actual game mechanics so here's an example to explain why the game mechanics matter in adaptation this is uh, a lord of the rings chess set and you'll see that there's the the bad guys and the good guys right um and you can maybe look at the uh, the character models and say these are physically uh very accurate to what the original was about right that, that they they represent the individuals um, you can start looking at the characterization. You see that the, the hobbits are kind of small, 
uh, not very powerful, whilst you know, you've got the king in the role of the king and the future queen in the role of the queen there. But then you start looking at the game mechanics here, and the hobbits are entirely expendable to protect the king in this. And that is entirely discordant with the original work. Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the, the queen is sort of the most powerful piece, and yet I don't think you'd say that of Arwen in the Lord of the Rings series. Um, and it doesn't have Gollum. Like, which side would Gollum even go on, right? Because he's a much more complex character than this game even allows. So you've got all sorts of ways in which this may look faithful, but you start getting into the game mechanics, how chess works versus how these pieces move in the real game of chess. Uh, and it seems very, very out of uh, out of sync with what the original uh, the original story was about. Now, if you want to really think about it, you know, if you think of the queen piece, for instance, um, who is the most powerful character in the story that can move great distances very easily and highly affect the course of the entire game, and that if you somehow lose them, you want to bring back to life. The queen is quite obviously Gandalf, right? Who is the not very powerful piece that moves very slowly, but is in fact entirely key to the whole win or loss of the game. The king character is, of course, Frodo, or perhaps just the One Ring itself, if you wanted to characterize it as an entity in the story. So there's ways in which you could make chess a little bit more faithful than this chess set has done. Um, but at, at its basis, it's, it's a very simplistic black versus white game can it really represent a nuanced story? So this brings us on to the idea of ludonarrative dissonance. It's a coin that was turned back in 2007 by uh, one of the heads of LucasArts. Um, and it's where the, the game's narrative, the, the story that you've got going on in the game, isn't matched out by the gameplay that you've got. If you're the hero that is destined to save the world, according to the story, why do you spend 20 arrows, 20 arrows, <laughs> Why do you spend 20 hours killing rabbits to increase your XP and get gold? Uh, why do you go around stealing people's homes? Or why do you put pots on people's heads for fun whilst they're having a dialogue conversation with you? you know, there's uh, various ways in which the things you're allowed to do in the gameplay, or even the things that the gameplay encourages you to do, because the systems you know, encourage you to kill or to steal or whatever else, that are entirely out of whack with what the narrative is. Um, so a few different examples. So immoral acts by the hero are, are a really common thing that you've got a gameplay system which says you've got all these numbers and you want to maximize those numbers. So if you get more of those numbers by stealing, then uh, you're going to steal, especially if there's no consequences to it. Um, the, uh, another big thing is where you've got a game with lots of side quests. You've been told that a dragon is flying towards the town and you have a small amount of time to go and save the city and save the, the nation. But then you start running around, you know, killing rats to earn extra gold or something. You know, you, you've got these, these side quest things which end up taking away from the main story and, and creating this distance between the way you're behaving and the way the story is telling you you're sort of meant to be behaving. Uh, there's a thing called physical misbehavior where... Um, Often in the game, you have quite a lot of control of your character. Um, but uh, that can mean that you do things that essentially look silly, right? Someone's having a very difficult conversation with you, a very serious conversation with you, and you're, you're throwing apples at them, or you're jumping on their head, or you're just changing outfits into weird different things, uh, stripping naked whilst this person is chatting to you as if you're not doing so. The game isn't reacting to your physicality within the game. Um, it can also be a big dissonance when certain actions aren't allowed. A character dies, and throughout this entire game, uh, you've been you know, reviving characters and stuff, but this character dies in the cutscene, suddenly you can't do anything about it. They're just dead, right? Um, or there's a fence that you're not allowed to go over, even though quite clearly even a short person could get over that fence. But the game obviously has put it there to block your progress because that, that area is restricted. Uh, these all create this, this idea of dissonance that take you away from a participant in a story uh, and turn you into someone just 
plugging out numbers in a, in a game. And it could be any game, and you don't really care about the setting or, or what's going on. So these problems are inevitable with games, uh, but there are different ways to overcome it. Um, so uh, one key way is to make sure that the different goals and rewards that you have in the game are matching up with the narrative. That uh, that you're not necessarily just getting gold for everything you're doing. That you know, if a character is poor, then maybe they're able to offer you some sort of favor or something in return, rather than the reward being, oh, here's yet more extra money. Uh, so you don't feel like you're a hero taking money from poor people all the time. Um, you have the game world react appropriately to you. So if you're running around and you're bumping into people, they go, hey. You know, when you see some games these days now starting to do that a bit more, having that more of a richness of interactions and more of an awareness of what the players really do. Um, prevent abuse of points or reward systems. So just making sure really that whatever systems you have, uh, whatever numbers are attached to your character, whatever rewards the character is able to get, that it's not encouraging somehow bad behavior from the player, or at least isn't encouraging behavior that is counter to the way in which you would expect them to engage with the story. Um, but importantly, you can't be too restrictive because then it doesn't feel like you actually have a role. You don't want someone to feel like they're just on rails being forced to, uh, forced to go along with a really scripted, narrow thing that you, that you, the designer, have said, this is how you must play the game. So it can be a, a tricky, tricky balance between making sure you've got the freedoms, but making sure that the world isn't, uh, isn't allowing think, something completely at odds with the story. Or if it is allowing things that are completely at odds with the story, then you have to think about, well, does the story need to be different? Right? Um, does the story need to consider that this your character might be a bad person in this story, right? Um, and again, lots of RPGs in particular play around with that concept. They've got evil, evil lines of uh, behavior as well as good lines of behavior and different endings and such that that interact with that. So let's go on to enumerating the unknowable. So a major source of literature that's used uh, in adaptations to games is uh, is magic or fantasy, um, or horror as well is, is a big area. And these sources often have the idea that the magic is somehow not something that's easily communicated, right? It's, it's a sort of a mystery element. Or in the case of horror, you've got these enemies that are entirely unknowable. Um, but how do you represent that in game mechanics, turning it into little numbers and systems and HP values or whatever else, uh, without utterly destroying that sense of mystery. Um, so it, here's an example of a, a Harry Potter board game, which <laughs> advertises balls actually float in midair. So for kids, they can have that sense of mystery because balls that are floating around because of some little physical airflow thing you've got going on that feels kind of weird and fun. It's not something they're used to in their daily lives. So it retains a sense of fun and mystery to them. Um, but there's a lot of games that do this badly. So in particular, there's a lot of Lovecraftian style games where you're just running around killing monsters all the time. That's really not what Lovecraft is about. If you're able to kill the monsters in Lovecraft, they're not Lovecraftian monsters, quite frankly. Or where the mechanics are turned into the mechanics of magic and throwing fireballs and stuff like that ends up feeling very scientific in a in a fantasy game. You know, your fireball does one d six damage, and if you wear this hat, it does one d six plus one. And it doesn't feel like magic; it just feels like a bunch of numbers. Right? That hat no longer feels special; it just feels like a plus one. Um, so here's a, another example where this uh, can be an issue in. In Tolkien, there's creatures called Balrogs. And one common debate amongst uh, Tolkien fans is, do Balrogs have wings? Um, and there's a lot of debate on this. If you, if you actually look at the description in the text, there's no description of it actually having wings. It has shadows that, that appear to be like wings. In fact, how do you physically display a Balrog at all is a source of major contention. I mean, the, the text itself says, um, what it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow in the middle of which was a dark form of man shape, maybe yet greater and a power and terror seemed to be in it and to go before it. That's it. Now, somehow this has commonly gotten uh, 
turned into this image of a demonic giant hell fiend, even though the description was like a man shaped thing, maybe a little bit greater than a normal man. But uh, we have this very common image of a Balrog now, which has been popularized by the movies, but it was around much before. Now, when we turn a Balrog into an enemy in a game, suddenly you are having to make lots of firm decisions about, well, what does it look like? Does it have wings or not? And we see some variety here. So we've got um, a Balrog, which has sort of vague shadowy wings in the Shadow of Mordor games, um, versus you know, we've got a miniatures game where it's physical wings that you can, you can poke and touch, right? They're real wings, right? Or you've got um, Angband, where the Balrog is a little letter B, that's, and uh, it's up to you if you imagine the wings or not. Uh, so that's, that's on the physical representation. What about the gameplay representation? A uh, key thing you often see in uh, fantasy games is the idea of elemental powers and resistances. So something might be an ice-style creature, and so ice-style magic or damage doesn't affect it. Um, and what you'll find is that in almost every implementation of a Balrog in a game, uh, the Balrogs are resistant to fire. The idea that if you have some spell or attack or something which has a, uh, an elemental affinity of fire, then it will only do half damage or no damage or something like that. And yet the text, the text says very clearly, Gandalf stating to the Balrog, I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. You cannot pass. The dark fire will not avail you, Flame of Udun. Go back to the shadow. You cannot pass. Gandalf is saying his fire is not affected by any elemental resistance of the Balrog. He's not saying in that way. But it's quite clear that the idea of this simplistic thing of fire, fire either works or doesn't, it's not so straightforward. There's good fire and bad fire and different sources and different, different, uh, different types of creatures, really. Uh, that entirely bypass the, the simplistic idea of, oh, this thing only gets 25% damage from this sort of source. And it brings us on to a, a general issue with these games is the problem with numbers, right? So magic ends up getting turned into science. Uh, and that's not necessarily how you want magic to feel. You want it to fe feel unknowable. So if you keep putting numbers on your magic, it no longer feels like it's really magic. It feels like you're using laser guns in space or something, right? It, it, in fact, there's lots of games where they've taken um, an entirely magic-based system and turned it into a sci-fi system. And they've kept all the numbers the same. They've just changed the setting around it. So you'll see like Warhammer versus Warhammer 40K, for instance. Um, or even you know Skyrim uh, and Fallout use the same engine behind them. They'll have a lot of the same numbers behind them. Um, and then when you have magic treated in this scientific way, the, the player is no longer focusing on it as magic. They're focusing on it as a narrow optimization of different numbers. They're, they're, they're looking at how can I min and max these different numbers. It's no longer this mysterious source of energy. It's just a tool. Right? It loses all sense of awe, of mystery, of majesty. Um, it could be the same if you wanted to try to include religion in a game. You, you can't turn religion into a plus five holy system that does three extra points of damage to vampires without losing the sense of it being holy. It's, it's no longer holy, it's a tool. Um, and with numbers, there's always a right and a wrong. Okay, there's, a, there's always a, this is either a negative or a positive. Um, there's no simplistic way, uh, or it, it turns everything into this sort of simplistic characterization, um, which again, doesn't fit with the idea that comes across in a lot of fantasy novels, that magic is something unknowable and untamable. And you see this in like the Conan books, and there's a, uh, and the the, the Tolkien, the world of Tolkien as well. Magic is always treated in this language of it's something no one really understands. It's there, uh, and it behaves in unpredictable ways. So how do we get over that? Okay. So uh, in terms of actual game design, there's various different techniques you can apply when using magic uh, in game design. Um, so one is this idea of Boolean effects. Instead of magic being uh, a magical effect, having a, a simple sort of number thing, it gives plus three to this. It instead has a, a simple, uh, uh, it does this in this circumstance, okay? It, 
a simple thing can be it can set enemies on fire or cause enemies to be afraid if used in this way. So it's sort of flicking a switch on something. Uh, and the reason why this can be powerful if used right is that you can end up with different magical pieces uh, interacting with each other in interesting ways. So that in this circumstance, this happens, uh, but not in these other circumstances. And then the players having to think about, uh, well, what are the, sort of the different things that they can put together um, in inventive ways to make the magic work for them without it being a simple, this is always positive, this is always negative. Um, you can have interactions using magic that are based on positioning or geometry or environment. So a certain effect might only work if you are near a tree, for instance. Uh, and this can tie in with whatever the underlying lore of the world is in terms of what, where the sources of power come from uh, and, and how magic really behaves with the nature of the world. Um, you can have environmental conditions, um, such as you know, if it's daytime or it's nighttime, uh, if it's raining, it have things behave differently based on nature. Uh, and it gets into that sense then that magic is part of the fabric of the world rather than just some simple on or off thing. Um, pick things as having multiple effects. So a magic effect will do this, but will also do that. Possibly magic will always come with a negative, depending on the lore of the world. Uh, depending on whatever the source is saying magic should behave like. So that you're always having to do different trade-offs that are much harder to simply make quick decisions on based on this is a plus one or a plus two. Um, you can use random chance in magic. Um, I've, I personally don't like having too much chance in games. It can, uh, I find that humans are just bad at understanding chance and statistics, and it turns it into a statistics game potentially. Uh, but if you've got something that has, say, a 10% chance of something bad happening when you use it, or, or potentially you've got a, a magic thing that you're using that every now and then will have a much bigger effect, you know, will, will really somehow tap into some, some magical stream or something and, and have a much greater effect than you're expecting. So it has the chance to surprise you in some interesting way. Um, but it's not so great if something, ev everything is just a, a 1d6, right? Um, and lastly, the idea that magic breaks the rules of the game, uh, that somehow you've got your systems in the rest of the game, which are maybe based on sword play or, or whatever else, but the magic somehow is breaking your expectations. Uh, and in games, you can do this in interesting ways because people are used to how certain things behave in games. But if you have something suddenly rise from the floor in a game, that will surprise you. Um, if you have an item that behaved in a certain way, in a very predictable way before, but suddenly behaves very differently, or even turns into an entirely different item, um, that can surprise you. you. You can have things like swords that talk, for instance. You know, that breaks the rules of, of what we normally expect and makes it feel more like magic because it's, it's a special thing. Um, there's loads of different ways to do this, but in particular, considering what are the normal gameplay rules of the game um, and what are the ways in which you can play with different expectations from the player so that so that the magic is surprising them and remaining interesting to them and, and feeling special. So, moving on to next, the idea of conflict without combat. And the picture in the background is from, uh, I can't remember the name. Uh, goodness me, that's gonna annoy me. God of War, I think it's God of War, where uh, you have one of the characters going around killing lots of gods and stuff. Uh, so based on Greek mythology, uh, and it's uh, it's fitting to the source material because those gods do like to fight a lot. Although it misses out on things like Zeus's reign of gold and turning into a swan and all that fun stuff. Anyway, lots of games that we have are very focused on combat. Right? That's the, the, the core interaction in the game is combat. And you're going around uh, fighting things all the time. Okay, um, And that can... A, get rid of narrative cohesion if you're supposed to be the good guy and you're just slaughtering thousands and thousands of something. Um, B, undermine the idea that uh, you're fighting against some big bad evil, but that big bad evil just keeps getting killed um, or all its troops get keep back getting killed. And it can get in the way of variety. If you, if you want some variety to your narrative pace, but all you're doing is kill, 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 uh, that is potentially not good for your story. Um, so this is uh, a scene from Silmarillion 
where uh, Hurin uh, bravely fights off uh, 63 orcs, I think it is, each time shouting, day will come again, before finally being overcome. 63 kills, before, uh, being a, a massive monumental feat that no one else has sort of done before. This is a Shadow of Mordor game where having dozens of enemy around you to kill at any time is just normal. It's completely normal. Um, so killing becomes much less of an interesting thing. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's, again, it creates this disconnect between what the source material is saying about the, the prowess of an individual versus what you're then doing in, in the actual gameplay. And in the Shadow of Mordor games, I think you end up killing thousands of orcs. It's, it's quite crazy. Um, but there's more than just combat to, uh, to what people play games for. So this is uh, some research done by Quantic Foundry on uh, different motivations behind what players look for in games. So uh, the idea is that you have these, these various different aspects um, and there's lots of different models for this, so I should say that uh, various different people have done different models on uh, the different aspects of gameplay and what people look for. So there's uh, these are on two axes. So one is cerebral versus kinetic. So cerebral is, is your thinking stuff, so your, your strategy games, your tactics games, whereas kinetic is your more responsive, real-time games um, where people get a lot of value out of destroying lots of things or killing lots of things or or completing lots of things in a, in a fast time frame. So racing games are very kinetic games, for instance. And then you've got the idea of world versus player. So the world being the story um, and maybe some sense of, of separation from reality, um, whilst the player being your own sense of uh, things that you're achieving. So competitive games can be very good for that, that sense of player satisfaction uh, because you're, you're getting to compete against others and feel like your own self-worth is good. Um, but there's a range of different things that fall into this in terms of things like exploration, puzzles, um, uh, different sort of strategy pieces that you can do, which don't necessarily need to involve straight up uh, combat. So here's a few examples. Um, and using the Witcher dancing scene as an example, because we can have, we can have things like dance offs games, right? And there are dancing games out there. Um, but certain games are trying to branch out a bit more from pure combat if, when they want to have an immersive world. So advanced dialogue trees is one way of, of having this. So you're, you're having to navigate or puzzle your way through some sort of dialogue system. And potentially, you know, you know, a good game will have you kind of using dialogue as a way to explore the characters and to understand the world. Also, also having you pay attention to what people are saying so that you're responding in the right ways, you're picking up on the right tones, um, and you're really getting into the character that you're meant to be uh, so that you're completing, you're advancing the story in a way which is uh, cohesive with the character that you're playing and the, the world that you're in. Uh, puzzle solving is a very common element in games. Personally, I hate it, but it's, it's a very common thing to have different puzzles. Um, as, as sort of blockers to progress. Um, what can be very good is when the puzzles aren't simply moves and barrels around, but are somehow connected to the story of the world. Um, and particularly you can have sort of magic-based puzzles, which are about completing runes, for instance. Um, you can have puzzles that uh, have certain timing effects that are needed. There, there's lots of different interesting ways to do puzzles. I'm not gonna get into too much of that, but there's, uh, puzzle solving is a big area of gaming that does involve combat. Exploration is another area. So there are games which are purely based on exploration. You're exploring large environments or you're, you're delving through deep caves. Um, and simply the act of finding new things can be interesting. Uh, and that can really tie in with the story. If you're discovering areas that have been talked about in the story and suddenly you find this great monument or you, you make your way onto this starship that was talked about and you're getting to explore it in detail. Um, having rich environments and, and different details to it uh, can really add to uh, the sense of uh, an interesting narrative that you're building upon. Construction or creativity. So Minecraft is the, the leader in this right now, uh, giving your players the ability to create their own things in the world. Um, uh, and I mean, construction is one big area and you see Minecraft, Terraria, other games like that. Uh, but 
there's creativity as in uh, if you've got the chance to create works of art in some way in the game or somehow make your own mark in the game. Um, uh, and especially if there's a social element where you can share that with others or work on that with others, um, that could be a compelling type of gameplay which doesn't have to involve combat at all. Um, and then skipping on just non-lethal dueling. So dancing it can be considered one way of doing this, but you can have combat duels with swords that don't necessarily need to involve death, right? They, they could be some sort of competitive thing. You can have arm wrestling. You can have, there's lots of different sort of sports type things that we do in the world that don't involve spilling blood everywhere. Um, so we can have challenges, uh, physical challenges in the game that aren't tied to death, that don't make the hero a mass murderer, which is you know a big problem in a lot of games where you're supposed to be the, the hero that saves the world, but you do it over a lot of dead bodies. Which again, if the setting demands that, that's fine. If you make the setting work with that, but if you want a, a sort of uh, a setting that, that isn't about that, or if you want, if you're adapting a story which doesn't involve combat at all in the original story, then these are the sorts of things you need to think about as, as interesting gameplay interactions that tie in with that story. So let's get some examples of some interesting games and then we'll have some open chat, okay? Right, so this is a game called Sill. Uh, and this is my favorite adaptation of Tolkien in gameplay form. Um, it's, uh, it's a roguelike. Um, as many people know, I am a big fan of roguelikes. Uh, and in it, you play an adventure in the Dungeons of Angband in, uh, in the uh, first age of Middle-earth. Um, and in this game, you play quite a weak character, um, exploring through the Dungeons of Angband. Your goal is to try and pry uh, a precious jewel from the crown of Morgoth, Morgoth the Dark Lord of the World. Um, and in it, you're, it, it looks a lot like a traditional kind of hack and slash game, but actually your greatest powers come through things like smithing and songcraft. Um, if you become especially skilled in uh, uh, the Song of Elbereth, uh, you will shine with such light that, that dark enemies will simply flee from you in fear. Um, there's lots, you gain experience in it, not from killing things, but from discovery. So the whole thing is about advancement um, and discovery rather than about your body count. Um, a lot of RPGs, unfortunately, they, they tie experience points purely to how many people you kill. Um, another great example of a... Uh, uh, Tolkien adaptation is the One Ring RPG. Um, in this game, you don't have hit points, so it's a typical thing in RPGs. So this is a tabletop role-playing game. Um, in this, instead of hit points, you have endurance, and uh, you end up having things like long marches where you need to reserve endurance. Um, and uh, if, I mean, if you've read Lord of the Rings, you'll know that a lot of the game is spent, a lot of the story is spent just walking about. You know, one of the big feats in the game is the march of the three walkers. Um, in the chase, chasing the hobbits that are kidnapped by the Urukai, uh, and that that sort of challenge is, is is adapted into this, where you're having to manage your endurance and go through long hikes, uh, and eventually, when you do get into fights, it's endurance that you need to consider. Um, you can engage with uh, riddles and song in this game, so you can have riddle fights instead of uh, combat fights, um, and you have a constant uh, uh, thing where you're having to resist corruption. Um, anytime you get any major treasure, there's a chance of it corrupting you, uh, which again ties into a lot of one, the themes in Lord of the Rings where, or, or in the story of Middle-earth in general, where major uh, gems and artifacts and different things will corrupt uh, the people that find them. Um, the Witcher series, uh, is they're an excellent series of games, but they also do great in adapting the, uh, the books of Andrzej Sapowski. I probably said that wrong. But the magic system, for instance, in this, um, you've got five main types of magic. Um, and there is a simple one, which is setting things on fire. But you've also got the ability to sort of uh, to uh, do what's called telekinetic damage, or where you're kind of forcing objects around the world. And that can create a lot of interesting effects in the world. You've got the ability to um, mind control people so that they either don't participate in battle or end up joining your side. Um, you've got various different potion crafting and things which can help you feel like you're a proper, or well, they're called witches in the game, but they're obviously sort of magicians of a sort. Um, it feels more authentically magical than the Dungeons and Dragons style of 
different levels of spells and different uh, uh, simple numbers attached to everything. Uh, King of Dragon Pass is uh, based uh, in the world of Glorantha, which is a fantasy setting created by Greg Stafford. Um, and this is a fantastic series of game where you're managing a kind of a colony of sorts, and you go through lots of the, uh, you go through various seasons. You're trying to explore an area. You're trying to uh, keep sacrifices up to the gods whilst interacting with different things. And this is a heavily story-based game where you've got various systems to manage, but you're having to consider your interactions with the world. Um, in this game, you have various advisors, um, and the advisors always give you advice, as they're meant to do. Um, but you have to consider, well, which god are they aligned to? Um, what, <laughs> how well do they understand this type of magic or, or that type of system? Um, are they very good at understanding omens or not? So there's a lot of uh, a lot of kind of soft focus, shall we say, on interpretation of the text that's put in front of you. So every piece of text isn't a simple, well, this is definitely this or this is definitely that. You've got to think in kind of um, uncertain ways, shall we say. Um, uh, it's a really fantastic and unique game, I would say. Uh, there's a wonderful game called Versu, where you, uh, this is only available on iPads, but you get to play as Pride and Prejudice characters for the most part um, in, uh, in different uh, Pride and Prejudice style stories. And actually it's got a few different, it's not just got Pride and Prejudice, it's got a few other stories and you can mix and match stories if you want. But you get to play as characters and it's got a kind of AI system whereby the other characters will react to how you are behaving. Um, and this is great fun because you can go to a dinner party and get disastrously drunk uh, or, or far too flirtatious for what would be considered the normal and see how these other characters from these popular stories behave. And uh, it's very well written. Um, and can produce a lot of different interesting effects. But you're essentially exploring through conversation, through action at dinner parties and other kind of these sorts of scenarios that appear in, uh, in these Jane Austen style novels. Wonderful fun, wonderful fun. Tales of Arabian Nights is a board game uh, based on A Thousand One Nights. And in this you're exploring a world as a sort of the world of uh, the Tales of Arabian Nights uh, stories getting into the different adventures. Um, every time you have an interaction, you are you're having to decide what to do. You can steal, you can bargain, you can negotiate, you can fight. There's a, a big different range of interactions and a lot of surprise in the different things that can happen to you. You can get turned into an ape uh, or cursed or have a, a lover chase you across all the lands. There's lots of different ways in which this game gets you involved in interesting and unique stories. And it comes with what's called the, uh, I can't remember now, it comes with a large book that you actually read stories from as you play. Um, and you're supposed to read the story to each other. So you, you feel like you're all participating in one big story book together. Um, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective is another board game. Um, so uh, in this one, uh, you play not as Sherlock Holmes, but as one of his Baker Street Irregulars trying to solve cases across London. You're given a copy of the newspaper of the day, uh, you're given a few clues, and you're told to go and do your own research and follow up on your own clues. Um, and it's, it's got a wonderful sense of making you try to feel like Sherlock Holmes, spotting the little details here and there, uh, whilst putting a case together and, and following up in different ways. Um, uh, again, wonderful for properly making you feel like you're in an Arthur Conan Doyle novel, because you, uh, you're delving into the, the little narrow details and trying to spot the links uh, in the text that's presented to you. There's, those are just some examples. Um, uh, I will say as well that there's lots of ways in games can do badly at representation, representations of literature. Uh, lots of pitfalls to look out for. Uh, but there's also lots of potential, right? So when done right, uh, games can really immerse you in the world much better than just watching a movie, right? When you are running around in a world that feels realistic, that you feel engaged in, uh, where your actions reinforce the story and the story is affecting the way you behave, uh, you can really tap into the uniqueness of this genre of, of making it, making, bringing these worlds sort of properly alive. Um, it's important to important to build on the different things that games offer in these interactive systems. 
that is that. So just have uh, stop sharing now. And I can see that there was some questions in the chat. So uh, yeah, if anyone wants to jump in with comments, questions, discussion, uh, go ahead. We can unmute. Hooray, we can unmute. It is, it is. Uh, yeah, no, Simon and I were just, uh, just basically just throwing backwards and forth some of the ideas um, that you were saying and, uh, and kind of, you know, I, I think you're probably aware you and I are of a mind uh, in this, in that, you know, sometimes less is more. We talked a lot about, you know, Wizard of Oz and kind of pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. And, and actually, in literature, they're, they're sort of having this conversation as well. And it's unfortunate in literature that there's quite a quite a movement the other way. And um, and so so there's a bit of a defense because you have the Brandon Sanderson's of this world who believe in the, the kind of systemization of, uh, of fantasy and, you know, the kind of you know, very kind of instruction manual kind of approach to, to fantasy. And actually, that's you know, that that's seen as a blueprint by quite a lot of young writers. And, you know, I, I think I was saying I had a conversation this week where somebody was saying, oh, you know, how, how do you, you know, and, and you're kind of trying to, to say to them now, well, maybe if you just step outside the box, don't look at it that way, try and look at it in a different way. And maybe, you know, the, the, you'll, you'll see something unique in what you're, you know, what you're trying to, to, to come up with. Um, a lot of interesting touchstones that you can kind of apply to this. I mean, I, I use Frederick Nietzsche, um, you know, with Dionysian and Apollonian art, Apollonian art being designed art, Dionysian being inspirational art, fuse the two together, you get something kind of unique and different and interesting. Um, and if you have too much Apollonian, it's all a little bit formula. Um, and uh, yeah, so no, I, uh, I, it's really interesting to think about this as an approach in gaming as a, you know, obviously also as an approach in, um, in, in, in storytelling and, you know, lovely to hear somebody who is also an advocate of, um, taking the numbers out. <laughs> People think they want to know the numbers, but they don't, they really don't want to know the numbers. I think there's, there's a certain element that we're at a stage now where a lot of modern readers and a lot of modern authors as well were raised on Dungeons and Dragons. Mm. And Dungeons and Dragons shoves numbers on everything, has systems for everything. Um, and a lot of RPGs try and get away from that. So the One Ring RPG I presented there, but there's, there's mm. lots of other RPGs which have very little in the way of booklets of monster tables and numbers and weapon tables. Uh, they don't have 13 different types of pole arms. You know, this sort of intense geeky detail this sort of fractal detail that dungeons and dragons has uh, other rpgs try and get away from and try to just rely on you know the dungeon master having an interesting story and an engaging experience which is what i also feel like that the fantasy book should do but unfortunately we've got people that have been raised on these crutches i, I almost think of them of these hard and fast tables and rules and numbers um setting up the way things should be and this is right and this is wrong and that's it um, well i think the one the point i was making with alan is you have a genre which is fantasy and the amount of stuff that if you just go and talk to the average person on the street about fantasy what they think fantasy is and i mean i suppose law um game of thrones has slightly changed that in one aspect but it's still very much the central talking characters the the idea that Fantasy is elves, dwarfs, wizards, and and the like in the Tolkien world. Whereas, if you actually go and look, fantasy is a much more broader range than that, and and so much of fantasy gets pigeonholed into that little Tolkien world. That when people come to write about a fantasy, that's their initial. That's what I'm going to. It's like you say the the blueprint of Dungeons and Dragons with the numbers and the various gameplay mechanics within Dungeons & Dragons isn't really what Dungeons & Dragons did. Dungeons & Dragons is the story that the Dungeon Master portrayed, and that's just a mechanism just to help him along the way to decide what his story should be. And 
and I think fantasy's got a very bad place at the moment because I quite like the fantasy to, that try and mirror some sort of historical intrigue. So say like you've got a period like with uh, Game of Thrones, like for example, it's a really easy example. You've got this this world that's that's set in a period of history that's violently you know, revolutionary almost, you know what I mean? You've got all these various bands and things coming together, whereas some of the Colk and Fantasy I've read, and I've read and played with quite recently with Dungeons & Dragons always seem to be trying to focus your brain back into that Tolkien world and it doesn't allow you to expand, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, I mean, I would say that as a major Tolkien fan, it's not Tolkien style, what people copy. It's Dungeon Dragon style, which I prefer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. It, so Tolkien was much less certain about this is how elves are, this is how dwarves are. What has been taken is like a cartoon version of Tolkien. Yeah, that's what. Uh, yeah, that's try one again. The, the character that Tolkien <laughs> used, it's not the world of Tolkien, it's the characters he used. Mm. You know what I mean? So the idea of the orc have, uh, orcs kind of thing, the way that Tolkien portrayed them in Dungeon the Dragons, you know what I mean? And it's. They've then other authors and other writers have taken those basic elements that he portrayed, you know, those although he was a little bit more rounder than they tend to be in gone. And it's got narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower this this sort of focus on what these characters actually are. That anybody else that writes something different immediately gets lambasted into, oh, that's not a fantasy. Well, they, and they fantasy by it. definition should be completely open, but it's not. It's this narrow thing like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they kind of they kind of get um, pilloried in in some communities. I mean, it depends on where you're you're kind of looking and, and going. I mean, um, so Christine Brooke Rose kind of identified this about the 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 Tolkien product back in 1980, and she coined the the term the megatext, which is this idea of you know the cultural assumptions that we have. And she was basing it off Roland Barthes from from the 60s where there is this, you know, as soon as a writer introduces a vampire, a vampire has a set of attributes and the, you, the writer doesn't have to talk about those attributes. Every, everyone has a cultural assumption or at least every reader that the writer is, is attempting to address has the same set of cultural assumptions. So they kind of go, oh, vampire, can't go out in daylight, got a problem with crosses, um, garlic. You know, and unless the, re the the writer is trying to subvert that, you know, and kind of say, actually, garlic's a myth, um, then then all of those cultural assumptions are, are given and you don't even have to describe them. Um, so, yeah, it's it's been going on a while. I mean, um, honestly, Game of Thrones is not a, not an outlier. Uh, Game of Thrones absolutely kind of kind of follows in this tradition uh, in uh, in terms of what's there. And. What you were saying, Darren, about D&D &D washing this, you know, D&D &D is because what they did is they took everything out. You know, they took it from all these different sources and then culturally washed it um, to try and make it, you know, um, uh, almost amorphous. So it could be applied, you know, take, you know, like Lego bricks, take your take your 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 Balrog from here and you can have it in your world over here, you know, and take your 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 goblin from here. It looks a bit like this and you can have it over here. And um, there's a really, really good video by Miniature Mashup um, where he's talking about, he's specifically looking at the Wizards of the Coast statement that was, that was given in the last month. And he's talking about the biodeterminism aspect of um, of d and and kind of moving the conversation on. Uh, and it's really well referenced, really excellently uh, done to kind of make make people kind of look at D&D &D in a slightly different way. But this cultural washing is absolutely what, you know, was, was sort of a part of what's there. But that aside, you know, it's a, a sort of a, a tangent of what we're talking about. I love the idea of going back to the partiality. Darren, do you think that the games have got, is, is there now a move or at least a sophistication in game design to be able to, to systemize for the program, but then um, not systemize for the presentation. Does that make my, make sense? Do you think there's do you think there's a movement, a willingness there to 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 move in that way? So you're gonna to have to explain. I don't 100% know what you mean by that. 
Okay, so so in terms of programming, if we're gonna if we're gonna make a, a fantasy world and we're gonna have a, a load of characters in it, we, we're we're gonna kind of stat them in in certain ways in terms of how they work. Maybe we're not statting them for combat. We're statting them for interaction, or we're statting them for you know for for sort of their their ability of benefit to the player in terms of the way in which they um, they end up interacting with them, whether it's by conflict or whether it's by something else. But in terms of the programming, we're programming it. So they've got to have some kind of okay, yeah. physical representation. Whereas in terms of the presentation to the player, there is no statistic or the, the representation is not statistical. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it does. So there's, there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot of that in game. So uh, instead of saying X has uh, you know, 50 HP, it's like X is wounded, X is severely wounded. There's a the kind of presentation element to that. There's, some people like it, some people don't. Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing I will say as well is that there's a big difference in pre-internet and post-internet games. Uh, pre-internet games, you could have mystery, right? Because you, you didn't know the answers yourself unless you, you bought a magazine that tell, told you what to do. These games, people will, will deconstruct the source of the game and pull out all those numbers and publish on a wiki and everyone can see it. Uh, so it's much harder to do that these days. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah I, I mean, I've got lots of memories of playing games as a kid, and and even with sort of early internet discussion, trying to figure out what does this do, what does that do, and the games would feel a bit mystical themselves because you didn't know what was going on, um, uh, and that itself was a kind of an interesting thing. But I guess we've got to kind of you know because um, Grant's made a couple of comments about players breaking those kind of systems, and yeah, they absolutely do, and there is a. You know there is a culture around doing that find the numbers so you can get ahead because there's a comp uh, competitive element in terms of of what's there you know finding ways to design that breaks that that break not 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 breaks the numbers but breaks the cycle of needing the numbers to get somewhere that's that's quite hard you know um uh you know getting that's people to to recognize this idea that that actually the 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 kind of fear that you have that this monster's still alive is more important cathartically it's more important to the experience than defeating it i think a lot of, a lot of games suffer from a problem now is that they want to have a structure where the player feels like they're in a continuous progress loop so you're you know you've got the start point some sort of story mm -hmm. and an end point and I think a lot of games I've seen quite recently that have been coming out don't seem, seem to be a more sandboxy option. That they don't want you to... The, you, the, there is some sort of storyline involved within the game, but then there's also this ability to go everywhere. But then you start hitting the problem that Darren was talking about, where you have all this stuff that's in the game that has absolutely nothing to do with the game at all. So it becomes, like you say, a very fine line between how you program a game and then how you portray that game to the consumer at the end. But I think there is, me personally, a lot more playability in a game that you can go back to because you're not quite sure, have I done all the storyline? Is there still bits of the game that I haven't discovered? Or is there bits that maybe could be done in a different way. And I think a lot of games are starting to put these multiple options in now, where that if you do go back and finish the game at some point, or for whatever reason you've done with it, you go back and play it again, and you have a completely different outcome. And I think that is the future of how games are going to be. Because if you say, say if you're going to wiki an entire game progress, it takes all the fun of it out for, you know, well, if you're going to do that, you're taking the fun out of it yourself. But if there's no wiki option where you go, oh, well, this is what happens if this happens, well, it might not. And if you could program those sorts of interactions into the game, but I think that's the future that no matter if you do, if you are following the strategy, that actually the computer might just go, no, 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 we're going to do this slightly different. And it throws that strategy completely out the window because it's not following that anymore. And maybe you have some sort of, AI sort of system that realizes that certain players are starting to play that way and then it completely changes the system to make the story a little bit more different or something along those notes. Here's why you have procedural generation in games so that every time you play it, you actually are encountering an entirely different world. Yeah. 
Um, and you can have things, you, you can have, say, a, an item or something that you simply don't see over the course of 20 games. So that when you do see it on your 20th go, it feels much more special than, oh, yeah, it's that item again. I got it last time. I got it again this time. Let's use it this way. So um, Jonas Karatsis, who worked with me on Phoenix Point, he, he did a little indie game called Omega Land. And uh, I've linked it up in the chat here on, uh, on Zoom that you can have a look at. Um, Omega Land is basically um, a satire of Mario set after Mario has saved the princess. So it's what the world looks like. It's exploring the world in terms of what it looks like after the quest is over. Um, and so there's, there's kind of a, you know, a completely different, you know, because everything, what, what you kind of don't realize maybe sometimes in, in some of these, these sort of um, you know, ways in which you escape into very simple games is that the whole world's set up around the player. So actually having a world that's not set up around the player or that was set up around the last player <laughs> rather than you, you know, can, can create an entirely different experience. But it also does reveal something of the, you know, of the kind of the, the, the fact that the, uh, half the cast are, uh, you know, outside stage left having a cigarette in between takes rather than, you know, rather than actually being in the, you know, the, the, the scene, as it were, you know, there's, there's kind of all sorts of, of, of different fourth wall uh, things that you can play with in terms of once, once you start to free yourself from that kind of box. Mm. Uh, if anyone's played Undertale, they'll know that that plays around with those ideas very well as, as well. Yeah, there's lots of ways in which you can use the fact that you know the player is playing a game and you can communicate with that to produce quite unique uh, interactions. How do you think um, something like a board game could portray something as immense as Lord of the Rings? So, because I don't really feel that I've ever had the experience of, 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 you know, this really epicness that comes across in something like that sort of book. You know, even with something like Dungeons and Dragons, it doesn't feel like you, you're really deep into the situation. So I've always wondered how you get that sort of, you know, so say you were doing a, a, a book of, um, um, well, let's pick one of it, uh, uh, random. So, say, say, like a, a Mongol type invasion or something histori historically like Kublai Khan or something like that. How would you get that into something sort of as small as a board game, but still keep people engaged and put the things forward? You know, board, I, games, board games don't have to be small, do they? No. Uh, say no. War, of the Ring. War of the Ring does this. And War oh, of the Ring of that, yeah. War of the Ring and and Journeys in Middle Earth. Journeys in Middle Earth is the is the 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 party, and if you've if you've not played War of the Ring, War of the Ring is is the war, you know, and it it and it really does. And the the um, Melbourne House did a um, did a conversion of it to um, uh, to the Amstrad back in back in sort of eighty eight eighty nine. I loved that game. Came with a map. Came with a you know, and you were literally you 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 couldn't see any of of of, of Mordor's armies. All you could see was what you had. And so I was sitting there on on Minas Tirith and going, "Hey, look, I've got three hundred men here. Why don't I march them into Mordor? I can't, can't tell what's. Oh, oh, that's why I don't march them into Mordor. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Battle after battle after battle. Look at them all die. Um, yeah. So there's there's some you know there's some really good. Uh, pieces that have tried to dramatize some of this stuff, but it it's still you know we're still kind of talking in the kind of conflict. What, what, what I'm saying is, is that it seems to be more that's more of a role a role playing game type thing. But what I'm saying is, is when it comes to look like a board gaming situation, War, War of the Rings a board very, game. Yeah, yeah, it's um, War of the Rings is a board game. It's, yeah. it's just narrowing that that focus, though. You know what I mean? Because you you're, you've got your individual characters and trying to tell a story in a period of an hour seemed to be a rather difficult thing for me to wrap my brain around of how you would get to do that you know what i mean so you tr you know that if you just go watch lord of the rings for example it's a th it's a nine hour experience for, you know mm. and trying yeah. to get like sort of overall uh, it's trying to try to find the right word oh you know like that sort of feeling that you've you've gone through the entire story basically in such a short period and have that in front of you while you're inter interacting with the player. I just don't seem to be able to figure out how, how that is, is done on board games. And I've, I've experienced it, don't get me wrong, like 
like Darren was saying, Tales of the Arabian Night is a great one because I played that with my daughter, how it manages to mm. tell a different story every time. But it's something I've struggled with actually understanding how that mechanism works in a board game. You know what I mean? How they manage to actually physically do that. And I'd say you have to choose your game for your medium for your, your adaptation, right? So if you want to have Middle Earth in a board game, maybe a giant nine hour epic isn't what you want. You choose a different aspect. You choose some sort of interesting hobbits, like what's going on in the Shire mm. type thing. Rather, like you could have the scouring of the Shire as a board game, for instance. Hobbit Simulator oh. 1.0. Yeah. <laughs> so not every piece of literature is designed for this style of game. You know, one problem I find with adaptations is often the person doing the adaptation has decided in advance, this is the type of game I'm making. And they're shoving the literature on, like just shoving it in the back hole somehow, um, to use a psycho cow term. Um, the, uh, and you'll see that in like the Shadow of Mordor games. They decided in advance, we want this action adventure type game. Even the Lord of the Rings movies, I would say, they decided they wanted an action adventure movie. So mm -hmm. they cut out a bunch of story and threw in a bunch of extra action scenes and extended what action there was because that was the type mm -hmm. of movie they wanted to make. They weren't didn't care about some of the the more plot oriented parts of the story. There's a lot more. There's a lot more character risk in the films. There's a lot more. Oh no, is so and so dead? You know, yeah. than there actually is in the book. So there's there's kind of that that narrative device is yeah. being so That's many good. times. The scouring of the share completely overlooked in the movie, for example. Okay. You know, yeah. So. Uh, Robert De Niro said they couldn't do it. <laughs> Too many endings, man. Too many endings, you know. Um, but no, to War of the Ring, I mean, is you know, is a is a massive epic scale. Twilight Imperium obviously does that kind of you know massive epic. Yeah, it does it very well. Um, but, um... And 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 having this kind of slightly um, asynchronous quality to to what's there, so that it's not just about conflict. You know, there are other other. I, I, I would I would like to ask Darren one question about gaming. What's your opinion on legacy games? You know the games that. Oh, I love them. So I've only been I've only played Pandemic Legacy, which I'm currently halfway through. Uh, we've been playing it during the pandemic, because, you know appropriate. Um, uh, I, I mean, I guess my experience with it is that you end up playing the same game a lot. Essentially, the, the tweaks are not that major. Uh, from what I've seen, Risk Legacy that looks a lot more interesting uh, in terms of the the interactions you get between people mm. um but it, it's a lovely idea i think a lot more could be done with the idea and i'll be excited to see what what else gets done with it um so i'm 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 going through gloomhaven with with a bunch of my my friends at the moment and um which is a you know essentially it's a legacy game that they tend to to end up stuck in the same combat model and actually you know, some of the stuff you were saying in the talk, you know, really, actually, if Isaac started to apply some of those ideas to it, it would it would really bring it out. And the other um, betrayal legacy, the real nice mechanic there is you get to name the items. So, you know, you 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 do one scenario and you have the vicar's book, you know, Reverend Reverend Black's book. And then the next scenario is the is their children coming back to the haunted house and they will discover Reverend Black's book. You know, so there's a real kind of epic quality to that in terms of the replayability there. Yeah, it's, it's giving a chance of cre for creativity there for you to be part of writing the story. You get to name them, so you yeah. get to name all the, all the different cool. pieces. And so then when you come back next week, you're playing the, you know, the descendant of your character and you find their old stuff. You know, that's, that's quite, quite funky. Well, yeah, I think that's probably, possibly the strongest um, advantage of Legacy Games, the ability to create your own story, because you're creating it together with a group, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I guess with Pandemic Legacy, which I've been playing, you don't get any chance to do that. You're, 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 the map is sort of changing based on how you play, but it more feels like a bunch of numbers changing mm -hmm. rather than here's an engaging story happening. I think they refined it, you know, in terms of the, the the legacy mechanic that's that's come into the different games. They've kind of refined it better. I mean, Betrayal's one of the later, you know, games that were. Um, I can't remember the designer's name, but he basically he was you know, he was brought into Betrayal. Seafall, for example, is yeah, let me try is, that. Yeah, it's kind of supposed to be a magnificent mess, isn't it? It's got this got this wonderful kind of idea to it, 
and it's dirt cheap. You know, you can pick it up for less than 20 quid anywhere because it apparently it just kind of doesn't quite work in the way in which it, it, it sort of uh, uh, play, um, pans out. Um, it makes me think that maybe there's the scope for a much smaller legacy game where each mm -hmm. round is is actually quite quick, but you're you're adding new cards or changing, like creating your own cards and stuff every time, so that mm -hmm. you're getting much more variance each time you play. Um, have you have you played Arkham Horror, the card game? Uh, I don't think so. So that way you were talking about this idea of the the kind of problem solving from Arabian Nights. You know, that's got a kind of, you know. Um, interesting uh, because it's two player you can play it with more than two players if you've got more more decks but what you do is you construct your deck for, in terms of your your solve cards and then you construct the narrative deck which is the the, the set of obstacles that you're going to come up against and then obviously they're both shuffled and you're trying to essentially you're trying to play your cards to match the emergent scenarios that... Um, right. So I've played um, the Lord of the Rings version of that, because there's a Lord of the yeah. Rings version. Same, same um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, because you end up with these sort of... You're, you're juggling things in interesting ways. I guess I found... I'm not a big fan of the whole, let's put my deck... Let's spend an hour putting my deck together and then have a 15-minute game. But there's but also... Some there's people also, love that. Yeah. yeah, and there's also the fact that if you've put your encounter deck together, you kind of know what's coming. You know, so you're losing a bit of that kind of mystery again, aren't you? Um, there's a nice game called Mage Knight, which is a fantasy yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Um, huge game, takes hours and hours yeah. to play. But you start off very weak. You're you're struggling to get the cards together to to fight an orc. But you're you're choosing your different upgrades as you go on, and you just gradually have this feeling of amassing like this big set of power that you can just throw at things, and you're taking down multiple dragons at once. And um, it's got a wonderful feeling that you put your built your deck over the course of the game, essentially, instead of building the deck before the game and then playing. Cool stuff. It properly gives that kind of ascending power feel. And it uses very little numbers. It does have numbers, but very, very low in the numbers. I mean, there's, we talked earlier about not using too many numbers. Board games are great for this because you can't use too many numbers in board games because yeah. it's just too... It's too mathematical. It gets too complex. Instead, you're relying on things like positioning, and mm -hmm. they can feel a lot more uh, natural um, than than just lots of numbers. I mean, one of the things you asked are, are games getting more and sort of obfuscating the numbers going on. And actually, some games are going entirely the opposite. They're throwing more and more numbers into the system, and every weapon you can modify in fifty different ways, and uh, it ends up this kind of giant number soup where no number matters anymore. No individual numbers. You're an amalgamation of numbers. You you hit and you know you go attack an enemy and fifty different numbers show up, and all you you're just vaguely paying attention to the health bar rather than individual things. So the numbers stop even having a big effect. Um, but you end up spending a lot of time fiddling in menus and things because the numbers do on aggregate matter. Um, I I Dark Overlord is worth um uh, worth a look as well. If you've not uh, if you've not played I Dark Overlord, you, you probably need need you know a couple of bottles of uh, of your 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 relevant beverage first, uh, and then uh, and then you want to play that. I, I, I played that with Karen and Chris, and yeah. that was a lot of fun. So yeah, that one you're just kind of it's a social game where you're just trying to convince. There's there's game elements, but it's more about you participating in a conversation. Yeah, um, which is fun, right? <laughs> All right, well, we should probably wrap it up there. What's what's next in the schedule? I believe it's the streamers are coming up. Um, and they're due in at... Oh, just keep talking. Just keep talking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're due in at half past, so they probably want a little bit of time for a, yeah. a setup and a, a bit and piece. But that was great, Darren. Um, yep. you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm probably going to try and steal you, to be honest. Uh, put you in a bottle and um, uh, and and give you to my students for an hour or two because um, I've got a whole creative development module that I've got to uh, do a do a set of classes for over the summer, which I'm then going to uh, give to them in September and October. So uh, you know, just just the way in which you presented that was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Very happy to to share things. Uh, and I, I can put the slides online somewhere if people want that. 
I, I think we'd probably pay you, you know, just just to <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure you're, you know, you're 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 not, you know, we'll pay you to to to, to sort it at a university. So you know, um, yeah, no, it's oh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Uh, I remember once I got contacted by a, like a media marketing agency that wanted to find out more about roguelikes. Mm -hmm. and they paid me money to talk to them for an hour about Rolex. And I was like, I do this for free all the time. I've got a podcast. I've, I've, got, a, I've got an interview. I got an interview on Tuesday with somebody um, who wants to to talk about the possibility of um, of landing on Mars. Apparently, being head of the British Science Fiction Association, I've got a. <laughs> Obviously, you know all about that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. I mean, my science is rubbish. Everybody knows my science is rubbish. So you know, I. I'm not going to be much cop on the on the the actual science of uh, of landing on Mars. I think, of, uh, sorry. I think when it comes, I was going to say, when it comes to landing on Mars and science fiction, though, you will have a lot more colourful ideas than the scientists will have. <laughs> you know, so they like that. I think in a documentary type of thing because it allows them to put those sorts of questions yeah. to the scientists whether this sort of thing is possible in the long run. No questions for you coming in on Twitch, but lots of love um, from people. Thank people saying it was fascinating. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Captain Spudgeon is saying, please, Darren, come to LaveCon 2021 and do this talk. So he was to hear it again. So <laughs> lots of uh, lots of appreciation and thank you so much for giving us your time.